Now, Ramin is a postdoc at the Web and Internet Science Group um, here in Southampton. And uh, for all the other um, tutors, except Claudia, I'm sorry for that again, uh, that I introduced, I tried to explain why are they famous. Um, so, Ramin is still early in his career, and we're all uh, in Southampton looking forward to his achievements and to him shining as a web science researcher. Now, he is definitely famous already in Southampton and maybe worldwide for being the first graduated PhD student in web science. Why is this a thing to be famous about? Because for us as well, and, and for the, this emerging new web science community, this is experimental, to put it mildly. Yeah? It's very difficult to bring communities together, especially when they're not from you know, the same areas and, and in the scientific discipline spectrum. It's very difficult to bring together quantitative and qualitative research, different communities who understand different things of what it means to do good research, what methods to apply, what conclusions you can take, how you can interpret the results of social media mining and the like. And Ramin is the best example to prove so that this so. can be done. And he can tell you more about his experiences probably during the week if you're interested. Um, other than that, he um, is a brilliant researcher um, when it comes to data analytics, combining data sources, bringing together um, different insights from the different disciplines that influence his, uh, his PhD research and putting it one, into one coherent framework that makes sense and reads uh, very well by us computer scientists, but also does not raise many questions or concerns from a social sciences point of view. Ramin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Well, thank you for having me as well today, and uh, I'll try and keep this a little bit shorter than, than what it was. Um, what I wanted to talk about, and I'll just introduce Vanessa, who's just walked in, I'm gonna and he's just going to walk out as well. Uh, uh, what I want to talk to today is about the Web Observatory, and also not just the vision of the Web Observatory, which Wendy's probably already given you, but more reasons why as a researcher we should be using this. But some examples of the kind of analytics that we've been doing with the Web Observatory project, I mean, not so much because of the web, but because it's there and we're having the data and we can share data that we can actually achieve these kind of analytics. And then some of the, and I think everyone's talked about this before in the other um, tutorials we've had today, uh, is the kind of dangers of big data and that kind of term big data and what it could mean and you know, all these great big sources but in reality we're talking about people uh, and we need to think of this and then maybe just a little bit I'll highlight on the um, the kind of hands-on with the web observatory which starts with a little bit on Hadoop because we use Hadoop here and what kind of infrastructure can we be using for and then Shin will I'll pass over to Shin, Shin Wang uh, who's just now uh, handling corrections Corrections done, everything done. Doctor Shinran as well. Yes. All done. So um, I'll pass over to, to speak about the Web Observatory portal and how we can use it and the kind of features that it has. So you've probably seen this as Fanasis' slides. When you talked about it, the web as a, as a mirror, a lens, um, and a catalyst. Um, but what I want to talk today is about um, how we use the Web Observatory to observe this idea of social machines. And social machines is this concept of um, probably again you heard, is the idea that um, humans do the creativity and the uh, machines do all the administration. So this idea of the socio-technical environment between where humans are doing something, computers are augmenting it, and we're providing some kind of new service, new system, new activity. And during the work that I researched previously and now is looking at how can we understand these systems um, and what are the mechanisms to allow us to observe them, and the World Observatory is this mechanism. Um, Data sources aren't just data sources, they are, they're not raw, they have, they have meaning behind them. And data sources on their own, they're not just individual, they're not isolated. They're this idea of an ecosystem of different data sources and different social machines. So we need some kind of mechanism, some kind of platform, um, and some kind of social construct as well to be able to 
to allow us to share these data sets and allow us to actually um, understand what they provide and, and what we're actually convinced that you can get out of them. Um, so the web observatory, I'll go through this and then the next slide is a bit more on the architecture, um, is a very kind of, fun the fundamentals of it is you have data sets and you do analytics on your, on your work. And typically when you do your research, you have it on your machine, uh, you, do your, you load up your own local host, you do your own kind of analytics, you store it in your own database, and then once you finish your research, once you finish your paper, your PhD, it's all gone offline, and no one knows what you've done. Um, the idea of the web observatory is to take that from another level to say, actually, like other people are doing, but we're trying to do this in a, in a, collaborative, in a collaborative way from a very ground up approach, is saying, you have data sets, I have data sets, let's list them somewhere. Let's put them up. You have analytics, I have analytics, you have visualizations, let's list them somewhere. Let's find a way to actually link the data sets, the visualization, and the analytics together in a, in a way that we can share, we distribute, um, and we can actually interoperate between different types of data stores and data sets. So I think Shin will, uh, will talk about more about the portal, but I just want to give you a little bit of the architecture of what we do. Um, so we try and separate these, these different areas into three different segments. So from the data sets, which are all the different data stores, so whatever you might be using and, and feeding it in, so it could be from real-time streams, it could be from harvested data, pre-harvested data, it could be some from other kind of sensor data. Try and use any kind of different data stores you like, Mongo, Hadoop, Sparkle, four stores, whatever it might be. Um, then we need a way to se separate the layers of the analytic tools. So you might be making some analytic tools in R, you might be using some kind of um, front end version for R to do some kind of real time processing of data that's coming in. Uh, you might be looking at Pythons, whatever you might be doing as we talked earlier today and yesterday talking about different visualization kind of suites that you can use. But then on top of all of this, we have the portal. Um, and the portal itself provides us a way to, as I said, today, Shin will show this, will provide us a way to access these different things and access what visualization is what using what um, analytic tool and what analytic tool is using what data set and try to understand all of these different and how this environment grows. This is just one version of the Web Observatory portal or one version of the architecture. It's going to be various others. But what we'd like to see is not only having this one here, it's say in Southampton, and we've already established this, having another one, say, um, like we've done already in Bangalore in IIITB, or another one, say, in um, UCA, or whatever it might be. Or another university, could be business, university, wherever. So, on top of that, some of the, the, the major things that we're trying to accomplish is simplifying the idea of big data. Um, and I'll talk about more towards the end on this sort of thing. Um, one of the big things in Southampton we're trying to do is, obviously in the web science department, um, for some, SQL is very, very difficult. So let alone um, getting them to say, please go and write me a MapReduce query to reduce 10 terabytes of data to this aggregated set. And they'll go, okay, I don't want to be doing that. Um, I'll run away. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make this as easy as possible. Um, there are, so if you go, for instance, in many of the Silicon Valley companies or even the big social data companies now, Facebook, it's very difficult for, for the, the normal researcher that doesn't have any technical skills to go in and say, I want to look at your data. You require the kind of query monkey to go along and say, I have this really important question I would like you to ask. And this, is, this comes from my experience with working with the social science as well, especially in, in the PhD. I've got a really nice question I would like to ask, and it's important to end. Hopefully it will provide me some real good insight into what this data can show. And they have a completely different set of questions that they want to be asking as well. Hold it, the fish. So anyway, um, we need methods to be able to provide us with that middle layer that says, OK, you have these kind of really nice um, questions, but how do we actually program? How do we interface with the data in a way that's accessible to all? So we've been developing um, different um, middle, middle layers now. And there are stuff coming out in the industry as well doing this. And, outside of uh, the university settings, um, to provide more SQL-like access to the data, but as well making it a little bit more simpler, so potentially you don't have the SQL skills, we can reduce that down to just doing nice user interfaces to make this achievable, so we can access some of the data, and I'll show you, show you that in a bit. Okay, so what do we, in terms of analysis, more of what we actually have and what we've been doing? Um, so what we currently have, uh, we have Twitter, 
as everyone else does. Um, but we have a double garden hose coming in. So we have now in the region of 15 terabytes of data, uh, which is around 12 to 13 g uh, billion tweets. Um, now obviously, this is, this is monolingual, it comes in um, and it's just a, a random 20% sample. This is large amounts of data and this is why we're starting to use distributed solutions like Hadoop. Hadoop. Um, and we're also looking now at looking how you could use potential new changes which are happening towards Spark and all these other new solutions to accessing large sources of data. We also have Wikipedia sources. So each, for each one of these I'll give you a quick example of what we've been doing with it. Um, Wikipedia is a great resource as we've all heard, Nigel just talked about it. Um, the kind of analytics we want to be looking at is not just doing some page counts and understanding what community talks with which community, but really, um, and this comes in, in two weeks' time, it's a, it's a great conference, so if you're around in London, uh, I'd really recommend going, it's called Wikimania. And what they're looking into is, what are the emergent features? And this is something that's really interesting for us as a researcher, so what are the emergent features and social processes that are involved in Wikipedia? Rather than just saying what are what community talks to who, but really what's the underlying reasons for why these communities are growing, um, and trying to draw upon some kind of real insight from social sciences. Um, yeah, we have different sources from Tumblr, Weibo. The two of the really interesting ones that we've we've worked on recently um, in Sociam as part of the project I'm, um, I'm paid for, I suppose is uh, the Zooniverse and IY, and what they are is citizens and science data sets. Um, so you can have. By the way, you can have access to all of these over this week um, and in the future when needed. Um, and what they are, they are talk data and sort of the classification data that someone uses in the citizen science project. So when a user logs in, they have the ability to talk and they also have the ability to perform tasks. We've got some nice data sets, um, especially the Zooniverse one that you might have to be, um, provide some insights that we haven't found yet. So in terms of some of the stuff that we were doing, one of the things is looking at interactions on Twitter um, and developing, using that kind of data store, the, the huge 10, 12 billion tweets, how do we filter down um, and establish different human characteristics based on the way information propagates. So the things that we've been looking at is, will it work? Oh, my videos. Let me see. Uh, well, should be a video, but no video works. So anyway, just imagine the lines. Um, <laughs> So what we've been looking at is how do we provide cascades of information beyond just simply around a certain hashtag? What emerges from the information in terms of external sources? So looking at URLs pointing into, or people pointing out from Twitter, but using those as a way to look at the emergence of cascades and information diffusion within networks. And this is ongoing work. Um, and the kind of insights we've been trying to work out is if we extract these cascades, can we use them as ways to perform search? So rather than having search um, as something that you can, that is basically an index, yeah? So we do search, you, you go on Google, you type your thing in and you get your search results back. Let's have a look at a new paradigm of search. Let's say, what happens if search is based on information between, uh, sort of the interaction and the intention between different social machines working. So if I wanted to find the answer to something, why am I having to re be returned back a list of information? Why not like Wolfram Alpha, I don't want an answer, but I want the actual information flow that provided or provides the most reasonable answer to what we, we want to do. So we're starting with information cascades and trying to understand how those can be used as a way to search. Um, another thing is about communities, but you've probably still all seen this other thing. Again, uh, drilling down from really large sources of information to actually identify communities. But what's different from um, the traditional community detection algorithms that we typically find, the local or the global, what we're, this works on is looking at how um, certain social theory, uh, specifically it's been called actor network theory, can be used to identify the emergence of characteristics um, within a network. So this is really drawing upon some of the, the interdisciplinary part that we have in web science. So it's looking at, so, in these theories, what we say, and this, these are just the insights I just want to tell you so you can perhaps think about this for your projects for the web observatory groups and for the other groups as well. But how can you use theory outside of the computer science to understand what roles actually emerge in, in, in the actual the sphere of what we're looking at? So rather than just doing feature engineering, rather than doing some kind of uh, extraction based on profiling, 
what does the actual network graph show us? What does the theory tell us about the way roles emerge, the way mobilities um, and flows of information occur to be able to tell us how different people interact with each other? So that's some of the work that we've been looking at. Um, so SAE over there has been responsible for a very nice project looking at um, entity extraction on large sources of data. And I think, if I'm not wrong in saying it, was probably one of the largest entity extractions performed on Twitter. Yeah. So what we looked at was um, how do you perform in, in a timely manner entity extraction and republishing it back through the timeline or through the chain of, of uh, uh, pipeline that we've been trying to produce as linked data, but all of the entities using um, online um, APIs rather than doing more flying compute. Um, and we had some results on that and uh, say just successfully got that published in semantics. So congratulations to say. Uh, another thing we've been looking at is Wikipedia. Um, and as I say, we're looking, and these are just some examples I think maybe you could think of how this could be, be used. Because I know one of the groups is looking at Stack Overflow, and who's, who's the ones at Stack Overflow and Wikipedia? Hands up. Group one, is it? Yeah, cool. So one of the areas you might want to look at is, and we've been sort of researching into now, is the multilingual aspect of Wikipedia. So not only is Wikipedia something that's really obviously rich in, in, uh, in data in a single language, there is communities that are operating between languages, um, and between, uh, yeah, between languages basically. Um, but not only just between languages in edits, but also between languages in talk and discussion. So one interesting area that we've, we've looked at um, so far is looking at how um, the edits uh, and, the, and the views of pages between different countries can help us detect different popularities of pages, trending pages within Wikipedia. So we establish a baseline figure of what a normal page view is, and then we understand, we try to detect when pages um, start to trend, and do they trend in an English time zone, do they trend in a Chinese time zone, for instance, and can you detect if those types of pages um, have specific topics around them, and we look at DBpedia, for instance, and use that to extract the categories. Um, but what we're interested on uh, what could be really interesting, actually, this time around, um, and for your guys' projects and to take it forward, is how does the communities, in, how do the communities interact? How do they interact across the talk? Because there's a huge function in, in Wikipedia of people talking and actually discussing, not only just editing, and not much work is, is on that area, so that could be something to keep in mind. So for the Zooniverse stuff, I haven't actually... Yeah. For the Zooniverse stuff, what we've been looking at, um, and this is, again, some insights you might want to do, is looking at how communities discuss and how there's a really nice feature of why we, uh, Zuni or citizen science in general is really, really um, important to study is because the ability for phenomenon and emergence of discoveries of serendipitous scientific knowledge actually comes out through this, the actual forums rather than just the task completion. If you're a task completion system, like Wikipedia, uh, like um, a recapture, for instance, or some human computation device, someone clicks a button and they perform a task and they get to the gateway, uh, the next step, what they want to do. With something like Zooniverse and Citizen Science, um, in general, what people are allowed to do is allowed to discuss on what they've seen and what they've, they've done. And this wasn't something that began at the very beginning of, say, Zooniverse or Galaxy Zoo. By the way, does everyone know Citizen Science, Galaxy Zoo? No, hands up if you don't. What? Serious. Right, okay. So, Citizen Science, or let's go with the example. Galaxy Zoo is a platform that has, so right at the very beginning, a PhD student had uh, one million uh, galaxy images to classify, and he wanted to find out what shape each galaxy was in the image, and if there was something odd about it. Um, so he sat down for a week and did 50,000 and thought, I'm not doing this anymore, I had too much. So he thought, what's a good way of actually classifying these galaxies? Obviously, they come up there in Oxford and they thought, well, crowdsourcing, why not we try crowdsourcing? So they set up a platform, they established a nice um, the Galaxy Zoo platform, um, and they put it out to the mailing list because they were in the astrology department, and, uh, and they got a good success rate, and I think within... A, Four or five months, they could classify all million galaxies, um, and they develop themselves some some baseline or some gold standards of what a good classification is. 
So they thought, oh, this is a really good idea. How about we expand this? And over time, they developed all these different systems or hybrids of Galaxy Zoo based on different things. So identifying animals in the Serengeti, looking at whale noises, uh, detecting bats in a cave, all these different really strange things, but are helping scientific knowledge. Some of the really, really nice stuff um, that's going on right now is, and I'm sure talk about in the next slide, is in the medical domain. So helping identify cancers within cells, helping identify neurons within the brain and how they interact with each other. Um, okay, so that's one part of, of citizen science, but what emerged from actually, and this is the kind of thing I was saying about emergent characteristics we should be monitoring. This is why we need the World Observatory. Um, one of the, the, the really nice things that emerged from this is the, the need for forums. So uh, at the very beginning of Galaxy Zoo, people said we were on other social media forums and saying we need somewhere to discuss as a community. We're, we feel like we're a community. We're not just a single task. Can we have somewhere to talk? Um, so obviously the, the Zooniverse team at the time said, yeah, fine, we'll put your forum up. And suddenly all of this, this community emerged and people were discussing. And within a few months, uh, a number of different scientific discoveries, which led to peer review papers being published, actually um, happened. Um, so this is the idea of how do we understand this? How do we support these kind of uh, these social processes and also how do we observe them? Um, but anyway, that was just a little vignette on, on uh, Zooniverse. But also, like I say, we have another project we're looking at, which again, you can have the data, you can have a look at, is iWire, um, which is a, um, another Citizen Nights project, but this time it's very interesting because it's gamified, okay? So one of the things that citizen science in the Zooniverse world say is we will never gamify our systems. They say gamification is, kills science and is not what the community wants. Now, iWire on the other hand has a thriving community and they've gamified it. Um, and they're, ex they're getting extremely good results and extremely really fast. So I don't know if you've ever played iWire or ever seen it, but I'd definitely log on to it and see how they've set up a, a, a platform, a citizen science platform, which is really, really smart. Um, it uses WebGL, really nice 3D really graphics. You have inline, inline chat, so it's like a real-time chat system. Um, leaderboards, points, bots, whatever you might want. It's really, really good. Um, so there is a really nice question is, what does gamification mean for citizen science? Does it reduce? Does it increase? Does it change the dynamics of the community? What type of, what type of community does it, it attract? So these are the kind of questions we're trying to do. And working with, and they're based in MIT, working with them, we're developing different um, platforms um, and different dashboards for them to view their, uh, their actual statistics of the system. Um, across social machines, so yeah, so this goes back to this idea of the web is not this kind of single, um, or data isn't just single, data is this kind of ecosystem and these machines are ecosystems. So one of the areas that we're really keen on looking into, we started now, is how do we draw upon multiple streams of information, not to do the kind of identification of users by merging and identifying different um, characteristics and saying this is user profile A, B, and C, but what we're interested in is how does one system like Wikipedia affect another system? How does the trends or the kind of conversations through Twitter, for instance, affect the, the um, viewing and editing on machines like Wikipedia? How does it affect places like Flickr? How does it affect the news? So, I mean, uh, the kind of the reporting that we see on news, does it change the timeliness of it? Um, so that's an area of, of research that we're really keen into, uh, to look into. So, I will just say a few things about where we've gone wrong. And you've probably seen something like this before. Um, I think Claudia was talking about this yesterday, so don't want to say too much on it. But correlation, causation, you all know that. We've, we've, we've come across that before. I've, I've ran up to, up to uh, Nigel and said, look, look, I found something. And he goes, have you thought about it more? So I said, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And then you go back, you away from your desk, and you think, actually, there's something more to this, and you look into another dimension, and you realise that what what was uh, what were you being seeing wasn't actually true. Um, the other thing, and I think I, I stole this from from Noshir when we saw him at the uh, at the uh, World Wide Web no the Web Science Conference for the Web was actually workshop was this image, and has anyone seen it before? Two, two, three. Okay, 
don't know. So, obviously, a drunk man lost his keys. Policeman goes, "Why? What were you doing? Oh, I'm trying to find my keys. Why here? Why it's under the light? Where else could it be? You know." So that kind of thing. Why are we looking just under the light? And this is really crucial for the Web Observatory. I've talked. Uh, I'm sort of a hypocrite here because I've said our oh, Twitter, Wikipedia, blah, blah, blah. but please think of sources that are outside of what we're doing right now. Um, we are all focusing on. Well, not all, but there's a, there's a strong community. Uh, especially websites that focus on Twitter, focus on a little bit on Facebook, focus on Wikipedia, for instance. What about all these other things? What about using the, uh, the common crawl? Why aren't we using something like the common crawl to actually do our analytics? Why can't we develop our own crawlers that are doing something to try and find emergent social property? So, something to think of. And the final thing that I, uh, I always think as well, is, this comes back from some training from, the, from my other supervisors, is people are more than numbers. So every time you ag do some aggregated count and go, ah, oh, 10 people did this, 15 people do that, um, and this means because of that, think about what you're actually trying to show and what you're actually saying. Because you, you, we've, there's been a number of papers now in the community which are really good statistically sound, but the interpretations of what the statistics are showing aren't actually thinking about what the real world affects or the real world causes of what actually are happening. Um, what time are we at? 17. Well, do you want to go through? I'll okay. cut it short now okay. because I can do, talk about the loop after. Do you want to do a little bit on the portal? Okay. Yeah. yeah. My name is Chin Wang, uh, postdoc at the University of Southampton. My research area is about distributed spark optimization, so it's kind of old fashioned computer science, it's coding and uh, wandering among algorithms. And today I'm going to walk you through the Vibe, uh, Vibe Observatory portal and uh, just show you how you can use this portal to create, to, to, up, uh, to list uh, some data sets, some analytics, and how can you build applications using these data sets through this portal. And now, here you see the front page of this portal. And you can see there's some select banner about some basic information about the portal, and there's two main entries. One is about data sets, the other is visualizations. Let's first go to the data set one. There's a list of data sets, so they are all existing, and you can query them if you have the access. And uh, they can be both public, like this shown, shown as a pick, or private. If it's a private, you have to request the sets, and uh, the, the system will send the request to the owner of the data set. And once you're approved, you, you should be able to uh, query the, the data set. And for example, this DBpedia one is just a, a mirror of the DBpedia as part of endpoints. And uh, uh, now you can see that I have access, so I can explore it. And you can see a panel where you can issue query to the data set. You just uh, submit this one. Just uh, a sample query uh, give you 10 triples uh, inside the DBP data set. And here you have more data sets like MongoDB and this one. Uh, available as a MySQL. And I think uh, this, this data set is prepared by Ramin, which will be used in later hand down session. If you have a data set and you want to edit it, you can just uh, click this button, and you can give your, the type of your data set, the, where your data set can be accessed, that's, uh, that's the query interface of your data set. And if there's a credential uh, required by your data set, you have to give them here the username and password as well. But don't worry about it, they, are, they can be protected uh, very securely in this system. And you can select whether it's, it's a private one, it's only uh, no one can access it except you, but you can grant the test to, to other users. Or maybe you don't even want to list this data set on this, on, on this portal, so it's only uh, visible to yourself. But that doesn't make any sense if you want to share, you, you want people to see it, right? And the same for the visualizations as well. You can add, add, add one or you can explore one. Oh. 
this um, uh, this example uh, created by our students last year with uh, collaboration with Tsinghua University in, in China. So all this work has been done within a week. And they are not all computer scientists. It's a, it's a mix of uh, social science and computer science. So that's, uh, they work pretty well. And so you can see that if you're a human user, you can just uh, explore the data set using this, this interface by uh, issuing queries in this panel. But it's not very convenient if you want to build some applications. You, you cannot just uh, issue the query in this portal and manually copy-paste the, the result to your application. That's super inconvenient. So what we, we are providing here is a, is a query API that allows your, your application to directly access the data set here and can do some automatic process with, uh, with the data. And here's the tutorial. It's not finished yet. I, I only managed to finish the query API part. And uh, this API, I mean, this uh, security issue here, you cannot just select the application to, get, to access uh, any data sites listed in this portal because they are private ones. And what we do is to implement an OAuth server to protect this query API. So you, you, firstly, you need to authenticate and authorize your application against this OAuth server once, once uh, you have this uh, valid legal access to a data set, you can, you, you can just uh, uh, pass through this all server and send queries to the data set directly from your application. The OAuth is a very popular and almost standard way to do things like this. And this happens when you log in to other, data set, to other websites using your Facebook or your Google accounts. It's like uh, uh, there's an application you visited and it pop up a window asking you for your username and password only for once. Then, then this application using this username and password to exchange for some tokens from this OAuth server and then it just use the tokens in the following process. So it don't have, doesn't have to ask you for the username and password every time, and the, the, your credential is, is safe. It's only known to yourself. The, the applicant never knows what your username and password are. And here is only, it's, a, it's kind of a complex uh, process here. So I just provide uh, some sample code written in, in, in jQuery, and, uh, which is a very, Mm, uh, widely used for for web uh, application development, and uh, basically to authenticate your your application against OAuth, firstly you need to create a new application which can be uh, which can be done from your profile page and the applications section, and you can just click this code and there's a create button. You just uh, fill the name and uh, the, the callback URI. Uh, the callback URI is, is not compulsory. It's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this um, it's it's involved in this all uh, mechanism, and it's not uh, uh, necessary to, to to talk about it here. And the name it doesn't really matter. It's only matter to you. It's only as identifier uh, identifier of the application. That's no uh, you know which one it is. The, the important part is this application ID and this application secret. They are basically the credentials, the username and password of, of your application, and you should keep them safe. Should be only known to yourself. Once you get these two strings, you can. You can send a post request to to this address. Uh, this uh, type of here is the web uh, slash o one. It's uh, this uh, developer version of the, the, the portal. Now it should be it should be using this one, this uh, uh, public one. And uh, you just uh, post with uh, the following fields. You have to have a grant type uh, equals to password and your client ID here to be replaced by your application ID and uh, your application secret and your username here and your password. And don't forget to code all these values. They are, they're supposed to be strings, otherwise they won't be accepted. And uh, once you've done this, you just post this kind of information to this uh, OAuth uh, entry and you should be able to get a response 
in the following formats. And the important part here is this access token. That's basically what your application will be using in the following process as the credential uh, of your application. Of, of, of the user, it represents. So it doesn't have to ask, him, ask the username and password uh, ever again. But there's a, there's a uh, existing time, the, the expired time for every token. So it will expire in 3,600 seconds. After that, you have to do this, do these things again and apply for another new token. Once you have the token, and uh, you know what you want to query about, and uh, uh, if you want to query some, some big sets, you, you only need this token, this access token, the ID of this big set, which can be obtained by clicking it, and you can see there's a random, random number following the hash symbol, that's the ID. And uh, in this example, while you're using uh, this MySQL dataset here, so you should see that the string here is used here as the EID parameter. And you just send this, this sample query, it doesn't do, really retrieve any data from the dataset, it just allows the, the dataset to compute one plus one for you. And uh, uh, here is where your uh, access token goes. This uh, is specified in the header of this get request. And the result should be returned in this parameter, this variable. It's something like this. It's a JSON object with a field called result, and the, the, the value is the actual result here. And it shows a solution equals to two, and the solution is a, a variable name you specified in your query. So if you want to build an application and uh, access uh, a data set and using the, you send some query to it, explore it, and using the data to produce some, some visualization, you can just follow, follow these two simple steps. And you can just actually copy paste, just replace uh, the parameters using your own secrets and ID or username password. And don't forget to replace this access token every time because uh, you probably won't, uh, you will never get the same access token uh, in two different uh, requests. And you can just uh, uh, get your result here and uh, do whatever you like and uh, uh, produce some visualizations for, uh, based on them. And once you did that, we highly recommend you to list your visualizations here so people, other people can see your visualization and they can know which data set is used shown here, the related data set, which data set is used to produce this visualization. So it's, uh, I mean, easier for others to reproduce your, your thing if they found your idea really great. Okay, I think that's uh, that, that's uh, all of this tutorial. And uh, if you, I mean, uh, the the API part is quite complex. I understand that, so you can just go to the tutorial tab and find this uh, sample code. Okay. okay. I think that pretty much covers everything we wanted to say. Yeah, I think um, so. I'm seeing a myth. Uh, no, but just. One thing that we would like to say, and we're working with RPI on this, is underlying all of the data sets themselves is we are making sure all of them have a common schema to describe um, what they are, who authored them, what project they're related to, um, all the different kind of things, and RPI are responsible for that, and they're also now producing, or we're gonna be producing a, a harvester to make sure all of the different instances of the web observatory, including ours, and the one in Bangalore, um, there's a few others that are going to be launched soon. Yeah. Um, we'll be harvested and we'll find a central repository or central place that we can find where the different data sets are. Yes, um, I added to that, you know, the metadata is embedded as the micro data on the data set list view. Okay. Yes. So we have, we have embedded metadata. Um, 
Any questions? Or hands-on stuff? Okay, for, for the Hadoop, if you want to get access to Hadoop, unfortunately, all we have at the minute is, because it uses um, LDAP, so we only allow Sotten accounts to access the, the actual cluster. Um, so if you do want data from it, so if you for the projects that you're doing, you do want queries, give me a shout and I'm going to see if I can get up a, um, so anyone that wants access, give me an email in the next sort of hour or so. I'm going to see if I can get you a guest account set up um, on Sotten so you can log into the cluster um, and do some. It's very, very simple. Maybe I'll show you now. Um, you can do some querying across, um, if you know SQL, slightly SQL, um, you should be able to access the, the Twitter and the, the different data stores that we've got. Let's see if we can get that up. Um, but who, who's here had experience with um, Hadoop? Two, three, four, five. Okay, so some. And it, who here doesn't, or doesn't know SQL? Doesn't know. Okay, so not, so here's everyone else. Um, <laughs> So what we use, uh, we have two ways of doing this. For people that know, um, well, there's three ways. If you know Hadoop and you know MapReduce, please tell me and I'll give you access to the server and you'll be able to run your jobs on there and we'll set you up an account. If you know SQL, we'll give you a second layer which is using Hue. I don't know, has anyone played with Hue? Um, Hue is a very nice way of accessing all of the, um, okay, I was going to explain this but we've sort of run out of time but we'll do a quick one now. Um, so, you have your Hadoop and you have your distributed file system. On top of that, you have MapReduce, so you can do your queries across these large data sets. On top of that, you can have these augmented views or kind of structured views of the data, which are um, Apache um, projects like Hive and Parler. They're all made by Facebook and all these different companies. And what we set up on top of um, the Twitter data store was Hive. So, it's, it's, it's chunked into monthly segments. Um, so if we have a look at the Metasort view, and what it does, it provides um, you access to the data in an SQL-like fashion. So if you really want to, slow, if you're not lost in the connection, um, if you really want to um, access it without using uh, MapReduce to make it a little bit easier, you can by writing um, SQL queries based on the uh, the table that we constructed. So they're per month from. I'm oh, sorry, I dropped up the VPN there. Um, they're per month. They're, 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 they are, let me see, yeah, there should be. So we have Spinner feed, which is Twitter, per month from here to, to from January to July. Um, and they each one of them contain in the order of two and a bit billion tweets. So if you want to access them, I'll give you access to this and you should be able to do some queries across that. Um, you can also, but it will take a little bit more time, you can access the, the, the main table there that says Spinner, which is actually everything from last um, August, and so that's about 10 billion. Um, but if you run that query, be prepared to come back in August and get it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, if, if you want access to that stuff, it's all there, and there's also the Zooniverse stuff on our cluster, and there's some other stuff. So just let me know if you want it. I'm around this week, and we can we can do that. Um, in terms of, um, I was going to give some tutorials on doing MapReduce, but I think it's more of a hands-on, one-to-one -one basis uh, because I don't know your level of knowledge in terms of using Java um, or Python or what your chosen language might be. So if you, if you want some help doing that and you're interested in doing that, please come and see me and I'll, I can give you some insights and maybe some sample code on what I use, badly done, and uh, you, can, you can fix it for me. Um, but yeah, apart from that, any questions, please please ask now or forever hold your peace. No, seriously, any questions, I don't know. Ah, just, just in time. What? I was asking questions, but no one, no one had any. So, do you have a question for me? <laughs> Not on the fly, no. No. Okay, then. So I'm, I'm done.